I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses and everyone who is joining us uh, this morning for a hearing titled Belarus, the ongoing crackdown and forces for change. Nearly a year after the brutal post-election crackdown of last December, the Lukashenko dictatorship has not relaxed its grip. Civil society remains under attack, with NGOs facing even greater constraints and freedoms of assembly and expression are severely infringed. Just a few weeks ago, Lukashenko further tightened his grip by signing amendments to two laws. One would tighten penalties for political and civil society groups receiving foreign aid, and the other would add even more restrictions on peaceful gatherings, such as the silent protest which resulted in the detentions of some 3,000 people this past summer. Yet, at the same time, there are reasons to ask whether the dictatorship may not be increasingly vulnerable. Lukashenko's popular support has plunged because of his repression and because of the ongoing economic turmoil. And Lukashenko is facing a new international environment. We can talk about how changing policies of the U.S. and EU and international institutions like the IMF may be affecting the dictatorship. The sad truth is that two decades after the demise of the Soviet Union, Belarus remains unreconstructed politically and economically and isolated from its European roots. The Belarusian people who have endured so much over the course of the last century certainly deserve better. I am convinced that the time will come when Belarus will be an integral member of the family of democratic nations. We need to stand in solidarity with the people of Belarus, with the oppressed and not the oppressor, to achieve these goals and the values we all espouse. So we'll have to talk more about what can be done by the United States and its European partners to promote democratic change in Belarus, both by assisting those struggling for freedom and by holding accountable those who perpetrate human rights abuses. The Belarus Democracy and Human Rights Act of 2011, legislation that I authored this spring, passed by the House in July and awaiting, awaits Senate passage. The Belarus Democracy and Human Rights Act uh, reinforces earlier legislation that I authored known as the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004 and 2006. The Bush and Obama administrations have put the provisions of the earlier legislation to good use. But this new bill will reinforce our message and provide new tools for promoting democracy and human rights in Belarus. For example, it expands the list of Belarusian senior officials who would be denied U.S. visas and be subject to asset freezes, so that the list would now include those involved in the post-election crackdown. I'll close with an observation on political prisoners. In the last few months, Lukashenko has released many of the political prisoners convicted in the crackdown. He obviously hopes to regain favor in Europe and in the United States in view of Belarus's sinking economy. The U.S. and the Europeans and the international lending institutions must not be taken in by this. Before we can improve relations with such a vicious dictator, we need to see truly meaningful changes and reforms, such as the release of all remaining political prisoners, full restoration of their civil and political rights, and a complete end to the harassment of all those who criticize the dictator. I'd like to now introduce our very distinguished panel of witnesses, beginning uh, first with uh, Alas Mikhailovich, who was a candidate in the December 2010 Belarusian presidential elections. In the protest that followed, Mr. Mikhailovich uh, uh, was arrested, as were six other presidential candidates and more than 600 other individuals. Held for two months in a KGB jail in Belarus, it is still called the KGB, after his release, Mr. Mikhailovich publicly denounced the conditions in his prison and described the acts of physical and psychological abuse that he and others endured. In danger of being arrested again, he sought and received political asylum in the Czech Republic. Last week, Mr. Mikhailovich was awarded Canada's John Humphrey Award for his courage and determination in defending human rights and democratic principles. He holds degrees in political science and law from the Belarusian State University and has studied at the University of Warsaw and the University of Oxford. We will then hear from Mr. Roger 
Potosky, who is Senior Director for Europe at the National Endowment for Democracy, where he has overseen NED's Belarus portfolio since 1977. Mr. Potosky has written widely on Belarus. His most recent article, A Tale of Two Elections, appeared in the July 11 issue of Journal of Democracy. An adjunct uh, in Georgetown University's history department, Mr. Potosky also worked in the U.S. Congress and at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and Jamestown Foundation. He holds an MA in Russia, Russian, I should say, and East European Studies from Yale University. Then we'll hear from Susan Cook, Cork, I should say, I'm sorry, who is director for Eurasia programs at Freedom House. Before joining Freedom House, she spent seven years at the State Department, most recently as the deputy director for European Affairs in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Of great interest to us because of the Helsinki Commission's mandate to combat human rights abuse, she has been the managing editor for the State Department's Country Reports on Human Rights Practices, where she has had responsibility for reports on European countries. She has also had supervisory oversight over DRL's civil society, media, and human rights programs in Europe, and of course that includes Belarus. She has a master's degree in international affairs from George Washington University, and we welcome her and thank her for her service uh, as well. I'd like to now ask Mr. Mikolaevich uh, uh, if you would present your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here about the terrible conditions facing democratic politicians, civil, civic activists, human rights groups, and lawyers in Belarus. As one of the candidates in 2010 presidential election, I was deeply involved in the events that took place during and after the campaign. The brut brutal crack uh, crackdown against peaceful protests uh, that began in, on December 19th and continues uh, to this day uh, has shocked not only the international community but also many Belarusians who were previously not interested in politics. Today, as we speak, a number of my colleagues including two presidential candidates, remain imprisoned. I hope that my testimony uh, will help their difficult conditions. I would like to tell you about my own personal experience. I was not naive uh, when I decided to enter the presidential race. After years of being a democratic activist, I clearly understood the state's repressive mechanisms, how they function and what they are capable of. But I also had a clear vision of how my country could be modernized and changed for the better. Back in 2010, during the dialogue process with the European Union, it seemed uh, that positive changes without, uh, within the regime were possible. Before the elections, uh, the candidates were allowed to campaign in ways they were previously forbidden. Many experts interpreted this softening of repressions as a sign of liberalization but it all ended with a brut brutal crackdown on election night. When I heard that many people had been beaten uh, by special forces, I used my car to help my campaign team bring the injured to the hospital or homes. Uh, that evening, I stayed with my staff at campaign headquarters. In the middle of the night, office officers in black masks and uniforms broke down the office door and arrested me. I was brought to a KGB detention center where I spent the next two months. During my imprisonment, it, I was subjected to constant mental and physical torture in order to co coerce a confession of guilt. Masked, masked KGB jailers carried out body searches five or six times a day. We were stripped naked and forced to assume various positions. For example, our legs were pulled apart with ropes Afterwards, it was difficult to, work, uh, to walk. Uh, we were forced to stand close to the wall with our arms outstretched until our hands swelled up. All of, all of this was done in freezing rooms, never warmer than 50 degrees. Some of the prisoners in poor health uh, fainted during these pro procedures. But those in the mask didn't stop. They wouldn't turn off uh, the overhead lights uh, at the night, but forced us to lie down and underneath the fl fluorescent lamps. We couldn't even cover our eyes with a, a, a handkerchief. As a result, our, eye, our eyesight began to deteriorate. 
prisoners were denied their legal right uh, to, med to medical help. A doctor could visit the prisoners, prisoners only once a week at a, at, at a specific time. Prisoners were also not allowed to see their lawyers. Uh, this was done deliberately to ensure silence about the torture. The isolation was used to force people into signing prepared statements and confessions. For me, it became a choice between remaining in jail until my trial or pretending to cooperate with KGB. At the same time, I, I had very little information on what was going on in Belarus, what was happened to my staff. I later learned that those working at my headquarters were detained and office equipment confiscated. Campaign workers were, re, 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 uh, were summoned on the KGB for interrogation. Those who called uh, to me to express their solidarity were questioned. My apartments, my apartment as well as those of my family were search, uh, searched several times by the KGB and my relatives were interrogated. I was unable to see my wife and daughters for two months. After my wife accepted an, invita an invitation to address the Polish parliament about my imprisonment, she was taken off the train to Poland before it left. When she tr uh, tried to get to Warsaw by car, she was followed by, the car, by, by several cars uh, of KGB and she was stopped near the border and escorted back to Minsk by uh, KGB staff. She was informed that she couldn't leave the country until I was indicted. During my imprisonment, she was left to care with, uh, for our two small children and was constantly harassed by the KGB. Due to this physical and mental pressure, I agreed to play the game proposed to me and signed an agreement with KGB. But as soon as I was released, I had a press conference to break the silence about the torture uh, that I and other has experienced. I felt uh, that I had uh, no other choice but to speak about it. Despite the risk of being arrested again, I still decided to publicize the torture so as to ease the fate of other political activists and peaceful protesters. I hoped that the pressure of them has diminished after my statement. I'm not a hero. I was not, it was not possible for me to stand under for the torture. I believed I could do more good by speaking about uh, what is going on in the uh, in, uh, capital of one of European countries. After I was released, it took me a while to adapt to new Belarusian reality. What was going on in my country can only be compared to Stalinist Gulag. Faced by an unpre unprecedented wave of repressions, uh, the country has changed. People were in intimidated. Belarus civil society was paralyzed with leading activists imprisoned or abroad. Since coming to power in 1994, Alexander Lukashenko has steadily consolidated his power and transformed Belarus into Europe's last dictatorship. Furthermore, uh, the regime has become a vi virus in the sense of that its authoritarian methods have spread to other countries in the region, such as Russia and Ukraine. The roots of Putin administ Putin's administrative reform and Timoshenko's prison sentence can be founded in Lukashenko's Belarus. Nevertheless, I decided to participate in 2010 presidential elections in Belarus. I, try, I, I tried to position myself as an independent candidate, distancing myself from both the regime and the, the traditional opposition. In my plot platform, I, adv I advocated economic modernization, rule of law, real separation of powers and democratic institutions. I saw my participation in the campaign as an opportunity to attract people who had never before actively participated in politics, but were willing to improve the economic and political state of the country without resorting to radical ideas and acts. During the violent uh, crackdown on December 19th, more than 800 people were detained, among them dozens of journalists and six presidential candidates. Many participants were beaten. More than 40 people were charged with crimes, including seven of the 10 presidential candidates. Today, uh, two candidates still remain uh, behind bars, Andrei Sannikov and Nikolai Statkevich. The health of many of the arrested and imprisoned is very bad. Uh, soon after elections, the campaign headquarters in most, uh, of most presidential candidates were raided and their work paralyzed. Equipment was confiscated and many acti activists were detained. 
The same uh, happened to offices of many prominent NGOs and human rights organizations. Uh, Alex Belatsky, chairperson of uh, Human Rights Center Vyasna and vice president of the International Federation of Human Rights, was arrested in August 2011. He is charged with massive tax evasion, is currently in custody and faces up to seven years behind bars. Recently, a new law is being considered that criminalizes all activities carried out with foreign funding. The authorities have attacked lawyers defending uh, the detained and the politically neutral bar association. My lawyer, who was speaking to media about my bad physical condition, was disbarred. As a part of pressure uh, on legal community, uh, mother and wife of my lawyer also lost their licenses. But it was not enough to the uh, regime. Criminal cases against my lawyer and his mother was started against them. Altogether, seven lawyers were disbarred and several thousands are still under so-called recertification process and can lo uh, lose their licenses soon. Uh, relative independence of Belarusian Bar Association was totally destroyed and now it is uh, totally controlled by Ministry of Justice. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that Lukashenko is ready to defend his power by all possible means. We can compare, unfortunately, we can compare Lukashenko with Gaddafi. And by the way, Lukashenko is speaking a lot about Gaddafi's uh, case uh, during all his speeches in parliament or with general public. So I urge the United States, European Union and the international community not to trust another game of liberalization badly played by the regime. Cooperate only with independent civil society in Belarus, non-governmental organizations, both unregistered and registered, independent news, newspapers and media, and democratic activists. This will be the main partners in Belarus after Lukashenko leaves the scene. We should not give a saving hand to collapsing regime. We should not replace one dictator in Belarus by another. The Belarusian people deserve to enjoy the same freedoms and rights enjoyed by every American. In the current situation, Belarusian human rights activists and NGOs need more international support and attention. The authoritarian regime in Belarus uh, has become a contagion negatively, neg negatively affecting other states in the region, even some countries of the European Union, such as Lithuania. Yet with the right changes, and the active support of civil society, the, co the country has a chance to turn into sustainable democracy and increase democracy and stability in all Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very moving and comprehensive testimony. Um, I'd like to now ask Mr. Uh, Potosky if he would present his testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak about the ongoing crackdown in Belarus. And thank you for all that you and your staff have done on behalf of Belarus, especially the Belarus Democracy Acts. I represent the National Endowment for Democracy, a leading supporter of civil society in Europe's last dictatorship, and we've been on the front lines of providing support for the victims of repression for more than 15 years. Alesh Mihalevich's testimony and personal story illustrate the appalling events that followed the flawed December election. But Belarus's bloody Sunday and winter repression are only part of a larger chronicle of egregious human rights violations that began when Alexander Lukashenko came to power 17 years ago. While unprecedented in its ferocity, this crackdown also calls to mind the brutal attacks on demonstrators in 1996 the disappearing of dissidents in 1999-2000, and the violence against peaceful protesters in 2006. Sadly, the repression continues today. As you have noted, more than 3,000 Belarusians have been arrested for participating in this, su in this summer silent protest. Scores have been detained, jailed, and fined for taking part in this fall's People's Assemblies, including just this past Saturday. The crackdown that began on December 19th has not ceased. It is destined to continue because force is a fundamental feature of this regime. The Lukashenko regime's human rights record has been repeatedly criticized by every leading rights body, including this commission. Fear has helped this dictator to stay in power. But Mr. Chairman, despite more than a decade of repression, there are indications that Belarusians are becoming less afraid. Today, for the first time, citizens blame the regime for the country's economic and political woes. 
support for and trust in the head of state and government are at historic lows. While organized protests have yet to gain momentum, there are signs that society is stirring. In addition to the summer silent protests, more recent events, such as the garbage strike in Borisov and the attempts to form a free trade union branch in Slonim, indicate that unrest is rising. Today I will speak about three areas in which, despite the repression, there have been positive developments. The first optimistic note is the performance of independent media. Since Mr. Lukashenko came to power, Belarus has been one of the worst perpetuators of crimes against free media. Hundreds of independent broadcast and print outlets have been closed down. Last year, a new, a law, a new law to regulate the internet came into force. Reporters Without Borders has declared that Lukashenko is a predator of the press and an enemy of the internet. On election night, scores of journalists were detained and had their equipment smashed. In the weeks that followed, more than a dozen media offices and journalists' homes were raided. During the silent protests, 95 reporters were detained and 13 sentenced to jail time. Today, three journalists remain prisoners of conscience. Yet despite this repression, independent media is thriving in Belarus. This is in dramatic contrast to five years ago when it was on the verge of extinction. Today, the top five news and information websites in Belarus are either independent or opposition run. Only two of the top 10 are state controlled. The website of the regime's flagship mouthpiece, Sovietskaya Belarusia, barely breaks the top 15. Since the December crackdown, independent media sites have seen their audiences grow by two and a half to four times. I will cite just one of many examples. In 2006, the independent online newspaper Belaruski Novosti had 1.2 million visitors. By the 2010 election, the number had grown to 11.4 million. As of the end of this September, the total had already reached 18.3 million. What we're seeing is, following the regime's precipitation of the political and economic crisis, society is increasingly searching for information and ideas from independent sources. One media expert noted, when something happens in Belarus, no one t turns on the TV to get news. They go online. Today, 62% of Belarusians distrust state media. And as one sociologist put it, propaganda is losing its influence. Ever-growing numbers of Belarusians are getting the real story about the country's collapsing economy, political paralysis, and international isolation from the independent media. The regime has failed to convincingly convey its version of the events occurring on and after the 19th. Independent media is winning the information war. Mr. Chairman, a second bright spot has been the exemplary work of Belarus's human rights defenders. Since the crackdown, human rights groups have had their hands full. But in contrast to a divided political opposition, they have worked together before and after the election to maximize their efforts and impact. Belarusian human rights groups created a common human rights fund in fall 2010 to render assist assistance to those in need, putting in place procedures and resources before the crackdown commenced. As a result, these groups were able to provide legal, medical, and humanitarian assistance to more than 500 repressed presidential candidates and political leaders, civic activists and journalists, lawyers and ordinary citizens and their families, including to Alesh, his wife, and their daughters. More than 20 NGO, political party, and media offices had their confiscated equipment replaced. This support has continued through 2011 and is, providing, and is being provided regardless of political orientation. All of those who have needed and sought help have received it. This work has been all the more impressive because, like Belarus's independent journalists, the human rights defenders themselves have been a primary target of the crackdown. At least 10 human rights leaders were persecuted following the elections. The chairman of the Belarusian Helsinki Committee was arrested on the evening of the 19th. The committee's office was searched on the, on the 5th of January, and the organization was officially censored a week later. The day after the election, the central office of the Vyasna Human Rights Center was raided. Ten of its members were arrested and all of its computer equipment and documents confiscated. On, July, on January 17th, Vyasna's offices were searched again, as was the apartment of its director, Alesh Bilatsky. The effectiveness of the organization's work was recognized by the regime when it officially warned Mr. Bilatsky for activities on behalf of an unregistered organization, a criminal offense in Belarus. I'm proud to quote Vyasna's response. We believe that our human rights activities are absolutely legal, 
and popular among Belarusian society. We will not stop them. Mr. Chairman, civil society in Belarus is still active and functioning in part because of the courageous and tireless work of these human rights defenders. It wasn't a surprise when the human rights community's leader, Mr. Bilatsky, was jailed in August and put on trial this month. It is ironic that he faces seven years in prison for not paying taxes on the funds that his organization received to aid those repressed by the regime. A massive defamation campaign has been launched by the re regime against Mr. Bilatsky, his wife, and his colleagues. But this has not prevented him from being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. It is a tribute to the tire tireless work of Aless and other human rights defenders that they have been targeted. It is a testimony to their organizations that the assistance to those in need has continued despite the repressions directed against their leaders. The last but most encouraging example is the social solidarity that has, been resu that has resulted from the crackdown. Because so many were arrested on the night of December 19th, the human rights organizations I'm spoken about were overwhelmed. Appalled by the regime's brutality, ordinary citizens step forward to monitor the assembly line sentencing in courts, gather information about the detainees, and contact families to let them know the fate of their sons and daughters. As the scale of the repression became known, activists made public appeals through the blogs and social networking sites that quickly spread throughout the internet. One web page read, hundreds of people are in jail, beaten, sick, and hungry. They do not enjoy the quiet snow or the holiday season. Restore their faith in the Christmas story. Do not wait for a miracle. Make one yourself. This was the beginning of what became known as the Guardian Angels campaign. And despite the fear, holiday vacation, and winter weather, hundreds answered the call. Within a day, an office was filled with donated clothes, food, medical supplies, to toiletries, and even toys for the prisoners' children. As the KGB raided organizations and apartments across the city, and the police tried, police tried to block access to an office, volunteers worked day and night to assemble more than 1,200 parcels for the prisoners. When jailers decreed that only family members could deliver parcels, the volunteers suddenly became the adopted aunts and cousin, cousins of prisoners. More than $50,000 was collected and used to help more than 400 victims by covering the prisoners' upkeep, medical assistance, and humanitarian aid to families. Doctors promised to rehabilitate the injured, and private businessmen pledged to hire those who had been dismissed from their jobs. Perhaps most importantly, the guardian angels provided a human touch to those whose bodies had been beaten and whose dignity had been trampled upon. They comforted the families of the detained and stood vigil outside the prisons in solidarity with those inside. They greeted those released, provided them with rides home, and passed along information on where to get medical treatment. It's not possible here to read even a fraction of the heartfelt responses to the angels, but what is clear is that while prisoners were grateful for the parcels, it was the solidarity that was the true gift that Christmas. One, one prisoner explained, it wasn't just about clean water or clean clothes. When you're locked away and helpless, it was important to know that people remembered and cared for you. Another wrote that without these packages, many of us would have left prison with just one thought, to leave this country as soon as possible, forever. But because of them, we came out believing in it should come as no surprise that the assembly of pro-democratic NGOs awarded the Guardian Angels its hero of Belarusian Civil Society Award. This social solidarity and self-organizing wasn't just a response to the election repression. It has continued throughout 2011, when the editorial office of Nasha Neva was raided and its equipment seized in January. It was able to keep publishing because its loyal readers donated more than 30 computers to the, to the newspaper. In the spring, when a teacher was fired for her political activities, 117 of her colleagues contributed part of their salaries to help her. During the silent protests, one group of volunteers gathered more than $4,000 in money, bottled water, and other supplies for those detained. There have been many more examples like this. As one newspaper article put it, a wave of repression has resulted in a tsunami of solidarity. Mr. Chairman, as inspiring as these examples might be, they are even more remarkable because Belarus remains a hardcore dictatorship. 2011 has been a year in which more Belarusians than ever have been beaten, arrested, and repressed. 
and Mr. Lukashenko continues to tighten the screws. On Sunday, he signed two controversial laws that will make it even harder for Belarusians to exercise their right of freedom of assembly and to receive foreign assistance for their civil society activities. Against great odds, independent media outlets, human rights groups, and citizen solidarity campaigns have performed admirably since the election, producing tangible and compelling results. But given the worsening conditions there, we cannot only laud our Belarusian colleagues' drive and determination. Civil society needs our continued support and solidarity. In my personal capacity as an expert on Belarus, I would like to offer three recommendations. Support for civil society should be maintained at current levels. Due to the crackdown, the U.S. government increased its support to Belarus in 2011. Much of this support went directly to aid independent media and human rights victims. The editor of one repressed publication mentioned, we never felt abandoned. But funding for Belarus is expected to decline to $11 million by 2013. I ask that we try to hold the line on the Belarus budget so we can continue to help those brave people like Ales Bilatsky and Ales Mihalevich. It is the right and moral thing to do. Secondly, more support must go directly to, to Belarus and independent journalists, human rights defenders, and civil society activists who are doing the good work I described. Too much assistance goes for soft, non-democracy programs fostering engagement with the regime. It is the Belarusian Democrats who are struggling to change their country for the better, and it's their efforts that must be supported. Finally, the most effective support that can be provided is that over the long term. I first started working with Oles Mihalevich when he was still in college back in the mid-1990s. Short-term and one-off programs have little impact or lasting effect in Belarus. In a dictatorship, it takes time for independent publications to build their capacity and audiences, for human rights groups to build networks and trust, and for NGOs to engage citizens who have, been, who have much to lose by opposing the regime. The outstanding work of Belarusian civil society in the post-electoral period is the payoff of years of investment. Please help us to maintain this commitment and it will continue to reap dividends. Despite the crackdown, momentum is building for change. Thank you very much for all your support and for, con continue, for considering these points. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> Mr. Potosky, thank you very much for your very long-standing commitment to the Belarusian people and to democracy for your very specific recommendations to the Commission. Uh, I also serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I, I know that I will translate that to the Foreign Ops uh, Subcommittee uh, people, Kay Granger and others, and um, as well as to the administration and to members of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So thank you so very much for that extraordinary testimony. I'd like to now ask uh, Susan Cork if she would present her testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, it is an honor to appear before you today for a very timely discussion on unbridled repression in Belarus. As someone who worked in common cause with the Commission staff, both when I worked for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and now in my role covering the OSC region at Freedom House, I've always appreciated the opportunity to participate in the Commission's important work. It is also an honor to appear today with Ales Mihailovich and Roger Potocki of the National Endowment for Democracy. They've both played a large role in working to improve human rights in Belarus. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to commend you for your leadership in securing the passage of the U.S. House Representatives Belarus Democracy and Human Rights Act of 2011. This is an extremely important bill that will reinforce the administration's efforts to foster democracy in Belarus and to show strong support for civil society actors and citizens of Belarus who are suffering under the dictatorship of Alexander Lukashenko. All of us here today hope to see a democratic transformation in Belarus in the near future. In Freedom House's annual reports, Belarus is ranked not free, and it's also on our worst of the worst list. The status quo is not sustainable. Yet Lukashenko will continue to do whatever he can, using any means, to preserve his own power and the system he created to perpetuate it. Since declaring victory in the presidential election of December 2010, he has increasingly used brutal tactics to maintain control of the country. As my fellow panelists have already spoken to the tactics used by Lukashenko and conditions on the ground, I will focus primarily on policy prescriptions and why the time is now. Unprecedented developments this year are leading some observers to suggest that Lukashenko's days might be numbered. Never before has Lukashenko faced an economic crisis in his country like the one he bears responsibility for today, with a collapsing currency, severe shortages, 
and dwindling hard currency reserves. Never before has he been under more pressure from the EU and the US through their sanctions for the regime's human rights abuses, from Russia through its cutoff of subsidies, and from the IMF for rightly withholding additional loans. In September, Lukashenko hit the lowest point of his popularity in his nearly 17-year rule, dropping to only about 20% support. Lukashenko can no longer assert that his regime provides for economic stability in the country, and the implicit social contract, which ensured ongoing support for Lukashenko, has been broken. As winter hits, and with it the imminent need to heat cold houses, compounded by worsening economic conditions, the discontent of the Belarusian people will grow. In order to put forth a transatlantic policy roadmap for Belarus, Freedom House and the Center for European Policy Analysis launched an expert working group in June of this year that included contributions from a bipartisan and international group of leading scholars and analysts, leading the, including those from the Helsinki Commission staff. We shared the results in a report entitled Democratic Change in Belarus, a Framework for Action, in events in Washington, in Warsaw, and in Brussels. Many of the recommendations I will share today are direct findings of that group. In short, and I will go into more detail, it is important that the international community maintain solidarity, not let up on pressure, and take actions to catalyze democratic change and transition. At the same time, however, those around Lukashenko need to know that he is no longer a guarantor of their own safety and stability, but indeed a liability which jeopardizes the future of the country. Lukashenko's departure from power may occur unexpectedly and is the responsibility of pro Belarusian pro-democratic forces as well as the international community to ease transformation in a democratic direction. Before making recommendations for forward-looking policy, I would like to first briefly recap some recent actions taken by the US, Europe, and Belarus. Belarus has been urgently holding out for an IMF loan, but based on the IMF visit in October, such a prospect does not look likely, as it requires a clear commitment, including at the highest level, to stability and reform, and to reflect this commitment in actions. The EU recently said that the, prog the success of progress in its relationship with Belarus is conditioned upon Belarus's steps toward enacting fundamental values of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. As such steps have not been taken, it was logical and sound for the EU to extend the existing visa ban and assets freeze until October 2012 for those responsible for violations of international electoral standards in the presidential elections and for crackdown on civil society and the opposition. The US government took some important immediate measures after the December post-election crackdown, including expanding the list of Belarus officials subject to travel restrictions and imposing financial sanctions. In August, the U.S. imposed more economic sanctions against four major Belarusian state-owned enterprises. The post-election crackdown pledge of 100 million by Western governments was an important sign of international solidarity. It is important now for international donors to coordinate and expedite the flow of assistance to those who need it including those beyond Minsk. Lukashenko's regime, however, remains defiant in the face of growing unpopularity and international pressure, and has orchestrated a new series of maneuvers to legitimize, in the eye of Belarusian law, grounds for further repression of citizen freedoms. Nothing except further mis misery and ruination for Belarus can be possible under Lukashenko. His departure would free the people of Belarus from Europe's last dictator and establish the foundations for positive integration into Western communities. In order to prepare for such integration, engagement, and change, here are 10 things the West should do and 10 it should avoid. One, do understand that Lukashenko is a threat to the decades-long vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. To the people of Belarus who have suffered 17 years under his abusive rule, and to peace generally through arms sales to rogue regimes. At the same time, do not worry about isolating Lukashenko. Through his actions, he has done that himself. Two, do maintain unrelenting pressure on the regime through economic sanctions to force the release and full rehabilitation of political prisoners and lawyers disbarred for representing them. It is the only way to win their freedom. At the same time, do not worry about pushing Belarus toward Russia. Indeed, stop viewing Russia, Belarus through a Russian prism. Doing so plays into Lukashenko's hands. Three, do insist on the unconditional release of all political prisoners. Thirteen are still in Belarusian prisons and even those who have been released have not had their civil rights restored. 
do not even talk about engaging the regime as long as one political prisoner still engages, still languishes in jail. Four, do raise questions about Lukashenko's legitimacy as leader, especially since the U.S. did not recognize as legitimate the results of last December's rigged election. Do not adopt a business-as-usual approach to Lukashenko now or in the future. Five, do engage more with Belarusian pro-democratic forces and insist on the unrestrained work of NGOs inside the country. Already, the EU and member states and the U.S. have done a lot on this score, but more can and should be done. On the other hand, do not invite Lukashenko's representatives like Foreign Minister Martinov to European partnership meetings, as was done recently. This lends credibility to Lukashenko's illegitimate regime and undermines attempts to pressure him. Six, do add Martinov to the visa ban list so that he no longer can peddle the lies of the Lukashenko regime. For European officials, do not keep going to Minsk thinking you can persuade Lukashenko to do the right thing. Seven, do question any major privatizations which Lukashenko seeks to fund his failing system. Instead, do impose sanctions on more state-owned enterprises, driving down their attractiveness for buyers and to prevent financial flows into the regime's coffers. Do not allow the IMF to offer a lifeline by extending assistance. This would simply be a betrayal of Belarus's pro-democratic forces. Eight, do prepare strategies for post-Lukashenko Belarus and recognize that the very idea of talking about such a future will take on a life of its own. At the same time, do not force artificial unity among the opposition. Let them forge their own democratic path. Nine, do encourage defections among Belarus's diplomatic community and even within the regime. Do not rule out turmoil within the ruling circle. There are clear indications that some officials see that the current political system is not sustainable and Lukashenko is a threat to their own well-being. They may be looking for a way out. Finally, 10, do you recognize that with an unprecedented economic crisis, there is no greater opportunity than right now to facilitate change in Belarus. Do not assume that Lukashenko will survive and stay in power for many more years to come. As Tunisians showed in driving out Ben Ali and in holding Tunisia's first free election, dictators of the world are not destined to rule forever. The same can apply to Belarus and Lukashenko. For the U.S. and Europe, the outcome in Belarus matters greatly. Lukashenko is determined to preserve his model of dead-end governance and avoid changing course from authoritarian rule and corruption. He will likely resort to old tricks and strategies, looking to exploit divisions between the U.S. and Europe and among EU member states. We must not let him do so. The U.S. and Europe have made many commendable policy steps in 2011, as well as a few that could be approved upon. Those in Belarus who look to the West have high expectations for an active, coordinated response to help them press for democratic change. We have nurtured those hopes. Now is not the time to disappoint. As we approach the one-year anniversary of the aftermath of Belarus's fraudulent elections, it is a reminder that the U.S. and Europe must redouble their efforts to bring about positive democratic change in Belarus and prepare the foundation for the time when the country is able to take its rightful place as a democratic European nation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for those very uh, specific recommendations, which uh, you know are, are just a blueprint for action. So I deeply appreciate that on behalf of the commission. Let me ask uh, Mr. Mikhailovich, um, when you spoke about the physical and the mental torture that you endured and your fellow political prisoners um, in order to coerce a confession of guilt, uh, and the other panelists might want to speak to this as well, you know, it has always struck me, and I've been in Congress now 31, almost 32 years, and my first trips were to the Soviet Union, and I have always felt, other than the propaganda value that they might glean inside the country, it is absolutely ludicrous uh, and absurd to think that anyone believes a coerced confession and, ha and that it has any value outside of the controlled press inside the country, and that, I guess, has some uh, validity. Uh, it's why they do it. But, I mean, in a, in a day when the Internet, obviously, and, and all the other independent media have the ability to overcome the, the government-controlled press, uh, such a, a signing is, is, who cares? Um, I'm glad you signed. I, I'm, I hope others would sign, come out, and then speak uh, to, to endure torture over a big lie effort on their part only brings dishonor on those who are perpetrating the lie, and that's 
the KGB and Lukashenko. When you described the tortures uh, and you pointed out that mass KGB jailers carried out body searches five or six times a day, uh, which is all about humiliation and, and degradation, because uh, it, it is not about trying to find weapons or anything. We all know that, uh, what they're doing here. Uh, you said we were stripped naked and forced to assume various positions. You also said our legs were pulled apart with ropes and we could feel our ligaments tear. That sounds like the rack. Uh, I mean, that is, that is just, that's outrageous. And I would like to say, you know, we ought to, rather than calling them the KGB, it ought to be the KGB P, P for perverts, uh, masked men who strip other men naked, uh, and women presumably as well, uh, that's, that's acts of perversion uh, that should not go unnoticed by the international community in terms of its degradation. Uh, it is a form of torture, and, I, uh, and you might want to speak to that, because I, I just think that is, and then you mentioned all the other things, including the lights and the overhead lights uh, uh, that were kept on all night. All of the methods of torture designed to break people uh, I would, so if you wanted to speak to that uh, or elaborate on that, because again, KGB, P, P for perverts uh, on the part of these, these jailers, and someday they have to know that there will be efforts made to hold them to account uh, for their crimes against humanity that they committed against you and all of your fellow political prisoners. Uh, so if you would like to, any of you speak to the actual torture issue, uh, and if you could also speak to uh, the, isn't it time that Lukashenko and other gross violators of human rights in Belarus uh, be indicted by prosecutors at the ICC, at the International Criminal Court? We know that a special request could be made from the Security Council. I believe and I plan on sending a letter to the Obama administration and to the Security Council to ask that an effort be made uh, to do this. I know I'm one of the few members of Congress who actually met with Bashir in Khartoum the perpetrator of crimes against humanity both in Darfur and in the south of Sudan. Uh, and, and the one thing he wanted to talk about was getting rid of the sanctions. And then when the ICC indictment was handed down, uh, that has him worried and scared. Uh, and, and it is something that potentially, especially in Belarus, uh, might have a, a, an impact in bringing that man to justice. We know Milosevic, Mladic, Karadic, and all the others uh, loathed being charged by the regional court, uh, Charles Taylor, and I can go through a whole long list of, of thugs who, when they're indicted and face the possibility and hopefully the probability and, God willing, someday certainty of prosecution, uh, are, are very much worried about spending the rest of their lives in prison uh, for the crimes that they commit. All about accountability. Why has it? this man, why hasn't an effort been made uh, to bring uh, an indictment against him at the ICC? And again, the torture issue, if you could speak to that, uh, again, um, and the issue of indictment. Anyone who would like to uh, uh, speak to those? So just thank you very much for your question. Um, it's about torches. So many people are speaking about it at the moment. It's really I'm very proud that I was the first who uh, started to speak about it and now wave of such people who are speaking about it. So with uh, great assistance from Radio Free Europe, uh, they made uh, in cooperation with uh, some human rights organization special program about torches. So it's more and more confessions, more and more evidences of tortures in, in, in Belarus and what we are doing, we're just collecting information and we are working with a special UN special reporter on tortures. The biggest problem is that those people who are still in prison, uh, they cannot uh, write any documents, any evidences directly to Belarusian P prosecutor office. So we are, unfortunately, we are limited that we should wait until those people will, will, be, uh, will be released, because in other cases, them, they, the torches simply will high pressure and torches will be more and more. So majority of people who are in prison, unfortunately, they are afraid. The same, by the way, definitely, while I, I was during two months in KGB detention center, I didn't complain on any conditions because uh, it, those who complained, they immediately were beaten, immediately were 
like level of torches were raised. So thank you very much. You know, I would just said, um, and it's why we should never lose our shock value uh, and our outrage when torture is employed. And it is, it is human nature that if you're in being tortured and face the prospects of being tortured again by being rearrested, uh, you won't speak about it, and others won't speak about it. So I commend you for bringing this to the table. I'll never forget Jeremiah Denton, one of the POWs in the Vietnam War, who, when, when very gullible Americans traveled to Hanoi uh, to say that the prisoners were being treated very well, uh, he, you might recall, with his, um, with his eyes, flashed torture in Morse code uh, to say that nobody was fooled uh, that torture was endemic, it was commonplace, pervasive uh, by uh, those who incarcerated those POWs. So um, more focus, not less. As a matter of fact, profoundly more focus needs to be brought uh, to, to, to light in terms of Lukashenko's uh, systematic use of torture. Mr. Chairman, I would just mention that uh, the human rights groups in Belarus uh, have spent two years putting together an alternative report on torture that was presented this week. Uh, in front of the UN committee there uh, in Geneva, uh, mentioning both the case of Mr. Mihalevich and others, um, so that they are working on gathering uh, evidence, uh, information on what has been taking place throughout these 17 years, and um, we do look forward to the time when it can be used. Would you also speak, if you would, to whether or not you think it would be advisable to begin the process of an indictment at the ICC, any of you, and, and of course, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Quirk. So, so we are cooperating with different groups, with a very influential British law firm, uh, on organizing processes against Lukashenko according to uh, legal systems in, in different European countries. Hope that it also will be not only in European countries. But also what we should remember, as I told, I stated that uh, Lukashenko is ready to defend, to defend his power by all means. It means that I'm absolutely sure that uh, quite soon we will see uh, hundreds or like hundreds of thousands of people on our streets. And unfortunately, Lukashenko and his special troops are ready to shoot to people like they're ready to defend the uh, power by all means. So uh, just as I predict that definitely we have more than enough evidences for to, to, to uh, like of different crimes made by Belarusian regime. But unfortunately, it's to my mind, it's only beginning more and more such cases and they will be unfor unfortunately, they will be very visible. It will be more and more of such uh, of such evidences. Thank you. Um. I think it's important that the violators of human rights in Belarus must be held accountable and that um, any means for doing so should be considered, whether it's the ICC, whether it's before the European Court of Human Rights, whether it's you know, looking to a post-Lukashenko environment. Um, there's been a you know, fairly severe information blockade in Belarus, and the people of Belarus do not know um, the abuses that the regime has committed. Um, in order to move forward for a better future for Belarus, it's important um, that the people come to terms and understand the abuses that were committed by the regime. Um, and thus, an important step to moving forward is to finding accountability both within Belarus as well as international instruments. Mention was made of uh, no saving hand to a collapsing regime. Uh, is there a sense? that it is indeed collapsing uh, or, I mean, in the past, and this applies to places like Cuba and elsewhere where human rights are systematically violated, uh, somehow the dictatorship is able to survive to abuse for another day. Um, I, I know that Mr. Potosky, you mentioned that the independent media is thriving, independent media is winning the information war, and I think that's, that's extremely encouraging. Um, but are we on the precipice of another major additional crackdown that would consolidate Lukashenko's iron-fisted rule? Wanna... Mr. Chairman, we've, we've seen so many crackdowns over the course of these 17 years that I would say that the 
independent civil society that exists today, those people who are uh, fighting for free media, for political parties, for NGOs in Belarus are, in a sense, professional dissidents. They've already lost their jobs. They've already spent time in jail. They have nothing else to lose. Um, they, I don't think, can be intimidated. I think one positive outcome of the crackdown that we've seen is that not one NGO or independent media outlet stopped working since the repression. Um, Belarusians, like Aless, are committed to the work that they're doing and uh, we're very proud to be supporting them. Um, we don't see the fall off in activity that we saw in past years and I think perhaps they also sense that this is the beginning of the end of the regime. Let me ask Mr. Potosky, um, again talking about independent media and online uh, uh, content and the like. Have you seen evidence of the Chinese government's um, uh, aiding and abetting Lukashenko's regime? Because obviously they've written the book on how to crack down on dissidents. And is, is that expertise uh, being shared with Minsk? From what we understand, the regime has considered and tried to implement different ways to block or filter or obstruct the internet in Belarus. But um, the Chinese have one thing that Lukashenko doesn't have, and that's a lot of money. It takes uh, a lot of resources to construct uh, the Great Firewall of China. Um, Lukashenko doesn't have those resources, thankfully, and uh, they've been largely ineffectual in blocking the internet and being able to deter people from getting out the information about the crackdown, the economic crisis, the international isolation. Um, we've been very proud to see that virtually every uh, independent website in Belarus has grown by two and a half to four times this past year, and the government has not been able to block them or stop them for more than a few hours or days at a time. I just ask you, what role does the church play in promoting churches of various denominations, in promoting human rights, respect? So the main churches in Belarus are uh, the biggest and uh, so-called official churches, Russian Orthodox Church. So certainly it is not playing any special role in only maybe sometimes they're speaking about Stalinist crimes, what is also quite positive uh, in Belarusian situation because it's like speaking about historical truths. Definitely Catholic Church is playing much, much better role because it's very much integrated into West community. And also there are very active, uh, smaller but very active Protestant churches and they are playing really a uh, very important role because uh, they experienced uh, very difficult Soviet times and uh, they are very much open for democracy, pro very open for promotion of so-called Western style of life. So it's really very, very important and churches uh, even under quite huge control from state sphere, churches are, are surviving and they are developing, developing their base and definitely it helped very much for democratic candidates because it's organized structure of civil society. Thank you. I, I, would, I would just add to that that um, we saw this week a very interesting visit of a papal envoy to Belarus, uh, Swiss Cardinal Koch, who spoke um, in a sermon this Sunday in Minsk about the right of uh, people to a fair trial. Um, I, I'm hoping that we're seeing, this is the third um, visit by, uh, by a high-ranking church member from Rome over this last past year, and I hope that we're seeing the church take a more active role, uh, the Catholic Church take a much more active role in promoting uh, democracy and human rights in Belarus like it did in Central Europe uh, 20 years ago. Does the International Committee for the Red Cross get to pay visits to the political prisoners? The ICRC, have they been able to have access to prisoners of conscience? Do they no, try? I have heard, I, I didn't, like, I, I don't know anything about such visits. Uh, as far as I know, Belarusian Red Cross is totally, it's like governmental, non-governmental right. organization, totally integrated into governmental system. And no one, I didn't hear that some, someone from such structures wanted to visit political prisoners. Mr. Potosky, you mentioned that too much U.S. assistance goes to U.S. contractors for soft non-democracy programs for fostering engagement with the regime. Uh, it is the Belarusian de Democrats who are struggling to change their country for the better and it is their efforts that should be supported. Could you just elaborate on that? 
I, I think when uh, Aless Mihalevich mentioned a saving hand, uh, he was referring to the IMF bailout of Belarus in 2009 and a period in time where the US and Europe believed that by engaging in the regime, we could win over Mr. Bel Mr. Lukashenko to become uh, more democratic and more Western. I think the crackdown destroyed all of these illusions, um, but I think some of the uh, aid programs that are still being conducted are under the illusion that by working with the state, with the regime, that you can bring them uh, to appreciate the values uh, that the Western community espouses. Um, I think that those programs need to be uh, canceled as, as like the IMF uh, consideration was for Belarus recently and that uh, we need to really re redirect most of our support to those who need that assistance in Belarus. Excuse me, I just wanted to add that because of such projects, which are quite important for local office of USAID, for example, they are lobbying some really strange ideas, like cooperating, like trying to agree on all Amer United States projects with Lukashenko government or even with KGB, for example. So it's uh, very strange ideas to my mind just because um, I'm not against some like soft projects uh, in cooperation, directly co direct cooperation with uh, registered organizations in Belarus. But the only problem is that because of such projects, uh, we are like forgetting about uh, su supporting civil uh, human rights activists, we are forgetting about supporting independent media because we should remember that economic conditions in Belarus are such that. Yeah. Uh, real uh, independent media will not survive without such help because it's huge, huge pressure on them from side of authorities. So I'm totally agree with uh, Ro Roger Pototsky that because of such projects we have a lot of really, uh, so it's like uh, very much like supporting Belarusian government with uh, forgetting about supporting civil society. Thank you very much. Just uh, two final questions before going to Dr. Gingri, a, a fellow commissioner. I was shocked and dismayed on another human rights issue uh, with regards to China when on her first trip to China, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said she was not going to allow human rights to, quote, interfere with peddling the United States debt as well as global uh, warming issues. Um, I know most of the U.S. now living in the U.S., as I know you do as well, uh, dissidents, Harry Wu, Wei Jing Shang, all the others, who were absolutely outraged by that statement and said that threw the dissidents in the Lao guy under the bus because we were too worried about selling our debt. So in other words, human rights were subordinated uh, in order to curry favor with the Beijing dictatorship. I'm concerned that the European Union and the U.S. are far too distracted. We do have, obviously, pressing and vexing uh, issues dealing with our own economies, but that should mean that uh, concern for human rights goes on a vacation. And I'm wondering if, if you could speak to it. Have we been as focused as we should be on, on bringing accountability and an end to this dictatorship in Minsk uh, as we should? Is Obama, is the EU, others doing enough? And I repeat my comment before, because I do plan on sending a letter um, uh, to all the appropriate officials. Is it time to indict uh, or to seek an indictment, because it's a long step to actually getting an indictment, of Alexander Lukashenko before the International Criminal Court? Ms. Cork? I would say in the past year following the December elections, the U.S. and the EU have been remarkably in sync and um, doing a lot of the right moves by extending sanctions, increasing travel ban, um, the challenge now is to maintain that solidarity moving forward. Mr. Lukashenko has been very good in the past at exploiting any possible divisions. And even this year, he's exploited divisions by having, for example, the Bul Bulgarian foreign minister going, thinking that he could cut a deal. Um, Lithuania and Poland both bear some responsibility in uh, the case against Mr. Bielatsky. Um, so the challenge now is to double down and make sure that there isn't any daylight between the U.S. and European positions. 
I would just add to that, I agree. Uh, I would add that the, perhaps the one area where there has been some disagreement between the US and the EU and where the US has really led is in terms of economic sanctions. The United States has been in the forefront of that. Um, Lukashenko's largest trading partner isn't Russia, it's the European Union, and European Union seems uh, happy to still uh, import uh, gas, oil, and petroleum products that either originate or travel through Belarus. Um, I think the European Union would be uh, better off uh, tightening economic sanctions, cutting off that saving hand uh, that Mr. Mihalevich referred to, and that if we could get our European partners to do more in this area, we really could bring down that regime. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I, I want to apologize to our three witnesses for coming in late. This is obviously a very important subject and uh, one of which I am extremely interested in, and, and so uh, please accept uh, my apologies. We had a markup in another committee, and otherwise I would have been here at the beginning. I did want to ask a question and, and maybe ask all three of you to respond to this, and I know that there have been some uh, recent amendments uh, to various laws that would appear to strengthen the security services, to outlaw protest, for example, uh, and indeed prohibit any foreign funding of civil society uh, and political organizations. Do these represent anything new, or are they essentially reinforcing what was already on the books or what has already been practiced? How, how dangerous are these recent amendments? And uh, maybe we can start uh, with uh, the gentleman on my right. Uh, I can't pronounce, uh, I'm sure I'll mess up your name, but I'm reading about what you have, have been through in regard to your detention, and I'm sure you have some very strong feelings uh, about this. So thank you very much for your question. Um, first of all, uh, New amendments is just bringing uh, new uh, legislation background for real process. For example, uh, it was punishment of civic organizations for uh, like receiving foreign funding. It was uh, extremely huge competencies of uh, employees of secret services. So it's more or less the same as it used to be, but the very important and uh, process is that Lukashenko trying to uh, convince his people, those people who, who are serving in his system, that they can do everything. If, you are, if they are killing uh, members or representatives of opposition, so he's trying to convince them that it's okay, it's like, it's legal. So it's like spreading of these legal opportunities for people within the system. Definitely at the same time, majority of them still understand that uh, if they're killing someone, it's illegal. Yeah. So I even if it will be uh, written in in uh, uh, current legislation, so that still the the majority of society they have understanding that it's just uh, Lukashenko trying to prepare uh, the system and to prepare himself and his uh, allies for like defending against society in case uh, if mass manifestations will start. So he is like preparing his people that please do everything in order to de defend the system. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, Mikhailovich, thank you very much, and, and we'll go to the next witness. I, I agree with my fellow witness that uh, the regime has never had a hard time in justifying its repression against uh, Democrats and civil society activists in Belarus, whether it's in the law or not. These laws are a sign of his increasing desperation in terms of doing all he can to prevent unrest from spreading inside of the country. Um, at the same time, it hasn't intimidated or uh, caused uh, any of the groups that we're working with to be less uh, idealistic or active in terms of opposing the regime. Ms. Cork? I would agree for the most part with what both Alas and Roger have said. Um, there have been plenty of restrictions before. I think this is a sign, though, that Mr. Lukashenko is increasingly defiant. As, there, as his unpopularity grows within the country and international pressure increases, he continues to put more legislative tools in place to justify more crackdowns. 
Um, Belarusian civil society has strongly condemned the amendments. Um, on October 20th, several civil society organizations, including the Belarusian Helsinki Committee, Viasna, and the Human Rights Alliance, released a joint statement in which they said the draft law on amendments to the state security bodies significantly expands the powers of the state security service, makes them uncontrollable, and actually puts them above the law. Um, another thing I would note is this summer there were a lot of uh, demonstrations, the clapping protests. Um, those have slowed down in part due to reprisals. However, the fact that there's more legislation in place to further restrict their ability to, for freedom of assembly, I think would have a chilling effect and dissuade them from taking to the streets again. Thank, thank you all very much. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Gingrey. Uh, let me just uh, add, just a, or ask a few final questions, and then I'll yield to Mr. Malash for a question or two. Um, last June, the UN Human Rights Council did condemn, as we know, the Belarusian government's crackdown on the opposition. Uh, they talked about serious allegations of torture and ill treatment in custody, the impunity of perpetrators, uh, and called for a visit. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, Palai, I should say, the head of the office of the High Commissioner, uh, wanted to uh, uh, undertake a visit, which apparently has been denied. And I'm wondering what your sense is as to the UN response. Uh, you know, strong statement from the Human Rights Council. Uh, has the UN uh, Convention on Torture, the Act Panel of Experts, have they spoken uh, about the use of torture? I mean, if we don't have zero tolerance for torture, um, then, you know, that, to me that's, that's, especially in light of what you have suffered and so many of your fellow political prisoners, uh, your sense on the Human Rights Council and secondly, the Committee on Torture or any other uh, relevant UN body. I know that the Belarusian human rights groups also produced an alternative report on the human rights review that was presented uh, uh, to accompany the Belarusian government's uh, report uh, that the UN reviewed. Um, the UN was strongly critical, as many international bodies such as the OSCE, OSCE have been, but um, like many, uh, they cannot travel inside of the country and cannot... Uh, and cannot uh, share these views with Belarusians inside the country. That's why I believe in independent media is so important to be able to spread the word about these decisions. The 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 the, the, G the committee in Geneva, uh, the committee against torture, hasn't spoken yet. Just yesterday, um, Belarus's envoy to the UN, who used to be the ambassador here in Washington, Mr. Khvastov, um, denied that Belarus practices torture uh, in the face of uh, statements uh, such as Mr. Mihalevich's. Uh, I don't think anybody believes him. I, I agree with you that in the 21st century, it's very hard to keep this information quiet. And uh, the government is, uh, in the sense, uh, constantly denying uh, its transgressions. We do hope that the committee will make a strong statement on this. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the 21st is the final day in Geneva for these decisions. We look forward to hearing their uh, comments, but we're pleased in a sense that the Belarusian human rights groups have been able to put together their own reports, present their own evidence, uh, argue this case on their own behalf, which is something that uh, they have not been able to do in the past and I think so shows a strong growth again in the self-organizing uh, and solidarity spirit inside the country. I would just uh, finally add that I believe the most efficacious way or means of holding Lukashenko to account and I agree with everything you just said, but it is to indict him. Mr. Malash. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll switch gears here a little bit with a, with a question to uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the approach taken by the democratic opposition. What, what is their basic message to, to the Belarusian people? I, I'm wondering if maybe they're, they, um, do you think they have the right message? Perhaps their message is, is uh, the fundamental message that, that, uh, that they all maybe have in common and speak to might be um, Lukashenko is denying us democracy, we want democracy. Maybe that's not the right message. Maybe the message should be Lukashenko is impoverishing us. Um, uh, you know, how, you know, what is their message and do you think they have the right one and uh, would you suggest another one? 
Second question, uh, the Polish model of, of, of solidarity that, the, that, that was just mentioned, Poland, of course, on the border, and, and uh, it's, it, you, you have Poles in, in, uh, in Belarus. It, it, was, it, it became the, the effective model of, of resistance in, in, in the 1980s in Central Europe. The, the idea was we're not going to let the dictatorship divide us up into you know, workers versus intellectuals or, or workers versus, versus, versus farmers. We're not going to let them play in anti-Semitism to divide us up. You know, we, you know, we're the 99 percent. They're the one percent, to use the, the, the current the current phrase. Um, what's the relevance of the Polish solidarity model in, in 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 Belarus? Has it played any any role? Have people tried to 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 use it, and how has that worked out? I, I'd like to hear from each of you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we should remember that uh, in Belarus, it like during last. Uh, in second half of 90s and be beginning of uh, 2000s, uh, we had an economic growth, and Belarus was, which was relatively poor during uh, like many years, uh, which started to become like more rich in uh, last years of the Soviet Union. Uh, for them, this uh, those quite high salaries they were like something except uh, something completely new so they were extremely loyal to the soviet union last years of the soviet union and they became loyal to the, to lukashenko because it was economic growth the salary were bigger and bigger they bought the first car in their life they made a good reparation in their houses in their flats so uh, and during last half a year because lukashenko wanted to achieve this standard of 500 dollars per month for every employ, uh, employed person before elections well, it's we had a like collapse of our financial system we had a, like very big problems in the economy and people lost uh, in their salaries three times so currency so exchange rate of belarusian currency towards dollar or euro cha like uh, was uh, decreased three times became smaller three times and people lost majority like three almost three times they lost in their uh, in, in their level of life and definitely majority of people became uh, unloyal to Lukashenko that's why at the moment he has only 20 percent of uh, of support and we should remember that in post-communist countries 20 percent are usually supporting any government so those who are in power they are supporting authorities they are not supporting someone personally but they are in favor of government of, of, of authorities so uh, Lukashenko lost his like I would say totally lost his support that's why our message at the moment is just changes it's not about uh, so definitely people understanding for it from economic terms because before like five seven years ago uh, we could rely and we could work only with those people who was caring about human rights who was caring about rule of law uh, but majority of people unfortunately used to be satisfied at the at the moment 80 percent of people are against Lukashenko so it's really very very big change uh, in uh, like in, with our people and just changes at the moment is our main uh, as our main slogan our main message for our population we are speaking in different ways uh, I mean but this word changes is the most important uh, coming back to solidarity uh, Roger in his speech told about huge uh, level of solidarity within Belarusian society when people were collecting money when Belarusian business was uh, just given money because they they they, they felt themselves guilty that they were not participating in, in protests against Lukashenko so it's like solidarity among people and uh, it's it's really very well developed and also I am absolutely sure that Lukashenko failed to divide us for example Polish national minority which is quite influential in Belarus is totally integrated into, into democratic movement. We are coming to, like, we are like standing together, we are working together. Uh, the same, uh, while I was a, uh, I was employer, employee, uh, em was, em was employed by uh, in independent trade union, we developed very high level of solidarity between different groups, workers, teachers, doctors, so, and it's working. I'm absolutely sure that Belarusian society is completely new society uh, it's completely different than society which used, we used to have in '94 when Lukashenko was elected as a president. Thank you. I would add to that that um, that uh, 
the message of change, I think, is not enough uh, today in Belarus, and uh, and that we've been concerned that. Uh, in contrast to the human rights groups or some of the other uh, parts of civil society that are more united, that the politicians are a bit more divided and have not yet presented an, uh, an alternative vision of the country that the public will respond to. And we are trying to assist them in that work and urging them to do so. Um, I think it's very important that there is one common message like Solidarity had in Poland back during those days. I would also mention, um, Alesh mentioned independent trade unions. Um, the one big difference we see uh, today in Belarus as compared to Poland uh, 20 years ago is the amount of activism in the labor sector. Um, we're just starting to see over the last couple of months the first uh, strikes, the first uh, un unrest amongst workers uh, which still comprise 70 percent uh, of, of state enterprises but Belarus is still really much a, a very state-run uh, economy and I think that once uh, workers begin to become more active that we will see more of a situation like we saw in Central Europe back in the uh, late 1980s. Ms. Cork? Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said but um, it's the economic hardships that have driven it's the economic hardships that drove um, the Belarusians to take to the street this summer. Um, however, only a minority is motivated by political issues. Thus, um, a message of change is important, but also recognizing that what's the the fact that the current social contract is broken is what is really driving the population to have dissatisfaction with the current regime. Um, as was briefly touched upon previously, uh, civil society has not done a great job at reaching out to the population. In part, um, as Roger noted, funding has gone towards soft things that have encouraged talking to the regime. And a lot of the population outside of Minsk is not understanding that both civil society and the opposition um, can help them in this time of economic hardship. So creating greater solidarity amongst the population civil society and the opposition is an important area to focus. Thank, thank you all for very incisive answers. Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Mr. Mikhailovich, uh, you said in your, your statement that you are not a hero. I just want to say you are a hero uh, and you are a very enlightened individual that helps this commission, but more importantly, the people of your beloved Belarus. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your testimony uh, and for telling the world with fresh insights what it, exactly what Lukashenko and his thugs are doing to the people, especially the bravest and the best, and that would be the political prisoners. I want to thank um, Mr. Potosky. Thank you for your expertise in, since 1997 working this very, very difficult issue of trying to bring democracy and freedom uh, to, to Belarus. And uh, Susan Cork, thank you for your expertise, for your many excellent recommendations. Freedom House is always welcome here. <laughs> Uh, and has helped this commission as well as my subcommittee, uh, the Global Health, Global Human Rights, uh, Africa subcommittee, time and again over the many years uh, with suggestions for legislation and for uh, holding dictators to account and helping those who are striving for freedom. If there's anything you would like to add before we conclude. Um, yes, Mr. Podoski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just, on behalf of those who suffered for the cause of democracy in Belarus after the 19th, I wanted to personally thank you for taking part in the Voices of Solidarity campaign that recited their names to the world over Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty during those difficult Christmas days. Um, it would be my pleasure to present you with a CD produced by RFERL and NED with that entire program, and we're, we're grateful for your efforts. Thank you for doing that very program, and thank you for presenting that. And uh, again, I want the human rights defenders in Belarus to know that they had many friends throughout the world, uh, including in the U.S. Congress, House, Senate, Democrat, Republican. We are all united in standing in solidarity with them. And so I want uh, the human rights defenders to know they are not alone. The hearing is adjourned.